Hi everyone. I hope uh, I hope you can hear me. Please let me know if there are any problems in in the audio or video. Uh, first of all, hello. Uh, my name is Nikola Tosic, and today, uh, in front of the FIB Young Members Group, I'm very thrilled to announce this webinar that we're having. So today, we're going to be talking about the development of an in situ lunar concrete, and we're going to be hearing from Peter Collins from Penn State, USA. So uh, learning about Peter and this topic before uh, the webinar was very exciting to hear that uh, this topic is actually being investigated because as we were now just discussing before the webinar, kind of a childhood fantasy of being an astronaut. Uh, as a civil engineer, this is the closest that uh, it gets. Learning about the challenges of making concrete on the moon with lunar materials and uh, you know all the other rules that are now in play uh, in these situations. So we're going to have the webinar from 5 to 7 today with a lot of Q&A. We'll save time for Q&A in the end, which I'm sure the discussion is going to generate a lot of uh, interesting questions. And just before we begin, I'm going to give a very brief, the briefest possible overview of the young members group uh, that is uh, organizing this webinar. Because many of, many of you have already been on uh, our online webinar series, I'm not going to take too much time. But I did want to introduce those of you who are new to what our group is and what its aim is and what its work is. So, of course, uh, within the FIB, the International Federation of Structural Concrete, besides all the different commissions and task groups that are covering the wide range of topics regarding concrete and concrete structures, there is also a recognition of uh, need for engaging uh, and uh, helping and stimulating the work of young engineers, both in the academia and the industry. And this is actually the task of the young members group to bring all this together and to be a bridge between the senior FIB and uh, its young members. So, as it says, our goal is to link and coordinate existing national young member, group, member groups and help build new ones. So the idea is the FIB is a federation uh, with member states, with countries having uh, member groups, that each of them has a young members group. So if they don't have it already, we help them start it up. So if you are currently uh, based in a country that you know uh, doesn't have uh, a young members group, you can contact us and uh, we can help you get it started. So uh, we want to help young people uh, get engaged in the commissions and task groups of the FIB. This is uh, the main goal because this is where the new knowledge through the FIB is generated. But also we want to help in organizing meetings, events and symposia around uh, FIB's annual symposia or uh, the PhD symposium or our own events and communicate both with, between the young members group with our young members and to the FIB presidium. So we hope to be a platform for dialogue, debate and communication between young professionals. And webinars like this uh, that now we are uh, getting more used to doing considering the global circumstances and the technology that allows it, I think is also a good platform. So this is, uh, you know, uh, not our first webinar. As you know, we have a lot of them up on the FIB YouTube, cha YouTube channel. This one will be available there afterwards as well. And uh, please uh, feel free to contact us with any questions about starting a uh, young members group in your country or joining an already existing one. The best way to contact us is uh, you can reach us on Facebook. We have our page and you can write to us and also the FIB website provides very abundant information about everything that you can be interested in and uh, there is a space dedicated for the young members group so feel free to explore it and let us know if and how we can help you. With that uh, I'll turn to our speaker of the day uh, that we're very excited to hear from. Uh, as I said his name is Peter Collins. Uh, he's uh, joining us from Pennsylvania State University in the US. Uh, he uh, graduated in civil engineering from Utah State University in 2018 and then got a master's degree also in civil engineering in 2019 from Penn State USA. Currently, he is a PhD candidate there and uh, 
the reason for him having this talk is that he is a recipient of two NASA fellowships. So the NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Opportunity and the NASA Pennsylvania Space Grant Consortium Graduate Fellowship. And even more, previously he did two internships. One was uh, precisely with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and the other with the Idaho National Laboratory. So Peter's research focus, uh, in which he already has extensive experience, is the topic of our webinar, developing a concrete utilizing in situ lunar materials, the influence of gravity on cement hydration, and the use of ultra high performance concrete within defense infrastructure. So as I said, this is something that at least I personally am very, very excited to hear about, and I hope you will enjoy it too. So uh, please, uh, even during the presentation, uh, type your questions in the Q&A section and at the end we'll get to them one by one. Uh, and at the end also you can uh, address any questions that you might have through the Q&A or chat uh, functions. With that, I invite Peter to uh, start his presentation and the floor is yours. All right, thank you for that warm introduction. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk about this development of an in situ lunar concrete. And please let me know if you can't hear me at all throughout this uh, presentation. Um, with that, I'd like to recognize a couple other important people that are working on this topic as well. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Edmondson and Dr. Richard Grugel, who are uh, research scientists at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, as well as my advisor, Dr. Alexander Radlinska here at Penn State. Uh, none of this work would be possible without the insight and guidance I received from them. Um, and so to get the gears turning on this topic, I'm going to start with a quick video that NASA put together. It does a good job highlighting our project and the work we've done to date. Cementing our place in space. Presented by Science at NASA. As your dog drags you around the block for his morning walk, you're probably not thinking about the wonders of the neighborhood sidewalk. But that concrete is pretty great. Next to water, it's the most widely used material on Earth. In the future, concrete may be equally useful off the planet, when humans construct a permanent base on the moon. They'll need sturdy stuff that can weather bombardments from solar radiation and meteorites. No one wants a crack in their moon base. The key to making out of this world concrete may be to study it out of this world. Two experiments have taken place aboard the International Space Station, or ISS, to do just that. The microgravity investigation of cement solidification, or MIX, and multi-use variable G processing facility, or MVP cell 05. Researchers from Pennsylvania State University and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center are analyzing the study's results. Concrete is a mixture of sand, gravel, and rocks glued together by cement paste made of water and cement powder. And it's not as mundane as it looks. Under the surface, it's quite complex. What goes on there is key to its strength and durability. Yet scientists still don't understand all the details of concrete's chemistry and microscopic structure. Processing methods aren't cast in stone. There's plenty of room for improvement. Alexandra Radlinska, principal investigator for both experiments, says, our experiments are focused on the cement paste that holds the concrete mixture together. We want to know what grows inside cement-based concrete when there is no gravity-driven phenomenon, such as sedimentation. It all begins when water is added to the cement. To put it very simply, the cement's molecular structure changes when the cement grains dissolve. Radlinska explains, as the old molecules dissolve, calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide start to crystallize. Myriads of these tiny crystals form all through the mixture, interlocking with one another and with the other concrete ingredients, such as gravel. The ISS experiments are researching how this all plays out in space. Radlinska says it could change the distribution of the crystalline microstructure and ultimately the material properties. The ratio of the water cement powder is critical to making the concrete components combine effectively and determining the strength and durability of the final concrete. Will this ratio need to be different on the moon where gravity is about one sixth of Earth's? That's the kind of question the experiment will shed light on. For the mix experiment, 
astronauts added water to a series of packets containing dry cement powder, then added alcohol to some of the packets to stop the hydration process at specified times. For MVP cell 05, astronauts also hydrated dry cement, but for this experiment, they used a centrifuge on board the ISS to simulate gravity at a number of strengths, including lunar gravity and Martian gravity. For both experiments, the samples were returned to Earth for analysis. We're already seeing and documenting unexpected results, says Marshall's Richard Grugel, co-principal investigator for MVP cell 05. Rudvinska adds, what we find could lead to improvements in concrete both in space and on Earth. Since cement is used extensively around the world, even a small improvement could have a tremendous impact. We might even end up with better sidewalks for walking our dogs. For more from the International Space Station, go to www.nasa.gov slash ISS science. For information about other weighty matters, visit science.nasa.gov. Uh, so that gives a good overview of our uh, topic and work that we've done to date. We'll dive in a little deeper into the specifics of that. Uh, I'm going to start with an introduction to cement, specifically the, the chemistry, because not everybody remembers back from their one class they had in their undergrad on the cement chemistry and the important reactions that happen there, because those are important to some of the results I'll show you. Uh, then I'll get into some previous microgravity studies that have been done specifically on um, the, the microstructure of concrete materials. And then we'll move into our project motives as well as the experimental setup in some more detail than what the video showed. And lastly, we'll get into uh, our results that we've seen to date from our initial ISS experiments as well as my future work in this development of an in situ lunar concrete. Uh, so with that being said, we'll start with an introduction to cement in the previous studies. Um, so ordinary Portland cement is our main thing that we know and love in concrete. It's composed of these four main phases. These are all written in cement chemistry notation, uh, where C3S is the calcium silicate, tricalcium silicate, uh, and then C2S, C3A, and C4AF. The ones I'm going to focus on today are kind of the two key ones that I view which are the tricalcium silicate and tricalcium aluminate, so the two in the blue color there, because those make up a large part of the binding component, the, uh, the strength that we know and love in concrete, as well as the C3A, which gives us uh, the workability period in combination with gypsum that we add afterwards. Um, gypsum is just as an important key component within ordinary Portland cement. Uh, it's what gives us the workability period from being able to mix it at the batch plant, take it in a concrete truck, place and finish it. So uh, we'll talk about the reactions that happen within C3S and C3A, again, because they're kind of key to understanding some of our results I'll show you. So the hydration of C3S systems in a uh, pure uh, tricalcium silicate system, so not in an ordinary Portland cement, um, one of the dominant reactions you have with C3S in water is the formation of calcium silicate hydrate as well as Portlandite, which is the CH. Uh, this is uh, an example of a reaction that can happen. It's not necessarily scientifically correct because CSH is quite variable. Um, that's why we have the dashes behind in between the C and the S and the H. Um, and so it can vary on a lot of different things depending on the age, the temperature, the initial mixture proportions, the water to cement ratio. Uh, the calcium to silicate uh, ratio can vary from 0.83 to 1.5 because of this, but it's the principal hydration product that we uh, know and love in concrete, giving it its most of its strength. It's viewed as an amorphous material, and there's a lot of research right now on its nanocrystallinity and looking into that to understand it better. Uh, but we like it so much because there's so much of it within ordinary Portland cement in the hydration process, and it's also stable in water. Whereas the calcium hydroxide of the Portlandite is not necessarily stable in water. And so we want to reduce that uh, if we can. And this is where we get into supplementary cementitious materials, which are pozzolanic, like a fly ash, which is a byproduct of the coal industry, right? So that can react with the Portlandite in water to form more CSH. Uh, and this is a key component when we start to look at the uh, reactivity of a lunar simulant and we'll get into some of those results in a bit. And so these are the, on the right there is a picture of a hydrated uh, pure C3S system with water. 
or the falsely colored blue uh, crystals, those are the Portlandite, and then the black and white specks in, in between all that is the calcium silicate hydrate, or the CSH. Uh, the hydration of C3A and gypsum systems, uh, this really depends on the amount of gypsum that you have, as well as the amount of C3A within the system, depending on what reaction sequence you're gonna get. Uh, while you have ample gypsum in the system, your dominant uh, hydration product is etringite through a, a reaction shown there. Uh, as you keep going on through the hydration process, you're gonna have remaining C3A most of the time. And so then the etringite will start to decompose and react with the remaining C3A to form monosulfate, which is MAFM. Um, in most cases, uh, due to carbonation in the world, you get the hemicarboaluminate and monocarboaluminate phases as well. And so somewhere between these first two reactions is where most uh, ordinary Portland cements fall into uh, the category where you have a little bit of etringite, but a lot of it started to decompose into monosulfate. Uh, the reaction sequence you don't want to necessarily see right at the beginning is the formation of these calcium aluminate hydrates, which are known to cause the flash set or false set where your concrete would set up within the first uh, 10 minutes or so. Um, but uh, some of our systems that we have, and I'll show you results for, were like an 80% C3A and 20% gypsum. So uh, it goes through all three of these phases where you get the initial reaction that forms etringite that all decomposes in the monosulfate and you still have remaining C3A, so you get these calcium aluminate hydrates. And this allowed us to study in microgravity um, the, all of the, these principal hydration products. As far as published results go for uh, investigating this hydration of cement in microgravity, there isn't really a lot out there. There's one group that's uh, got done numerous kind of parabolic flights. Uh, is when you talk about simulating microgravity if you're not going to do it on the International Space Station in a true microgravity environment, there's numerous ways you can uh, have that environment uh, produced here on Earth. Uh, one of the popular ones, of course, is a parabolic flight where you have a jumbo jet take off at a steep angle about, as it's shown there, 47 degrees. When it hits that 7,500 meter mark, it cuts its engine and uh, starts to go into a floating and free fall state. And then when it hits that same mark on the other side of the a parabola there, it turns its engine back on and pulls out of the descent, and they do this over and over in a flight. Uh, but that uh, free fall period gives them a microgravity environment for about 22 seconds. And now, if you think about the hydration of cement, as well as uh, the strength gain within concrete, we test uh, our normal cylinders and stuff, right, at one days, three days, seven days, and 28 days. So 22 seconds isn't a lot of time to investigate the hydration of cement fully. And so there was a knowledge gap there that we started to try and fill. Um, but from this parabolic flight study, these guys were able to um, look at the aspect ratio of etringite crystals. We talked about the reactivity of C3A and how that's hindered by gypsum. It's highly reactive in water, so you get this instantaneous precipitation of etringite. And so they were able to study that within the first 22 seconds, and they uh, looked at the etringite crystals under an SEM and we're able to measure the length and diameter. And these are the results that they showed. Uh, they also tried these in a variety of different uh, super plasticizers as well to see if that affected the aspect ratio. And as far as putting an image to this, this is kind of what they have in one of their journal papers, where on the left, you see the terrestrial gravity uh, etringite crystals. They're kind of uh, short and plump, whereas the ones in microgravity are more long and columnar than uh, the ones in terrestrial gravity. And they, this varied, the results varied depending on the superplasticizer they were using. But again, they were only able to study the hydration of cement in the first 22 seconds. So there's a significant knowledge gap that needed to be filled there. Uh, now we'll get into the project motives as well as the setup, experimental setup that we did for our initial experiments. Uh, so the real motive behind this development of an in-situ concrete in a large part of the microgravity investigation of cement solidification process is the Artemis program. Artemis is humanity's return back to the moon. And it's a fitting name because it's the twin sister of, the Apollo, of Apollo. And Apollo was the original missions that took us to the moon in the late 60s, early 70s, and we haven't been back since. Uh, and as part of this program, uh, we're going to put the first women and the next man on the moon in 2024. 
And the goal is to have a sustained human presence in the years after that. And that's where uh, pieces of infrastructure will be needed and concrete like material is a viable option for that. Um, but a little side note to get us back to the moon, NASA has developed the Space Launch System, which is gonna be the world's most powerful rocket and stand over 300 feet tall, depending on the top cargo carrier por portion of the rocket. Um, the picture there on the right is from one of my internships I had down in Huntsville, Alabama at Marshall Space Flight Center. And that is just the liquid, liquid hydrogen tank. And that stands about 130 feet tall. So you can imagine how tall this actual rocket will be uh, when it's all stacked on top of one another and it's the full scale. Um, but it's right now, the picture shows it in a test stand where they have a bunch of actuators at the bottom there. You can see right above the people's heads, the little white specks. Those are an array of actuators and they're able to mimic the conditions that this tank will experience during an actual rocket launch. And they pass their uh, test with flying colors and actually, actually tested it till failure to see just how much of a load it can withstand. And as engineers, we like to understand and see that. So I'm gonna show you the quick uh, 40 second video of them testing this to failure. Um, so what they found from that is it was able to hold with uh, withhold 260% of the, the load it needed to from the rocket launch for a, a period of five minutes. So everything's on track, everything's passing with flying colors for getting us back to the moon. Um, here's a quick timeline, again going back to some of the motivation and where we're at with all of this from 2020 to 2024. Um, there's going to be a numerous missions over the next couple of years that before we put humans back on the moon. Uh, Artemis 1 is the first one, and that's uh, just sending the human spacecraft to the moon for the first time in the 21st century. Artemis 2 will be a human flyby of the moon. They're not going to actually land on the moon quite yet. And then they're developing what they call a gateway. Um, gateway is, you can think of it similar, I guess, to the International Space Station that orbits Earth, but gateway is going to orbit the moon. So these astronauts, uh, when they get to Artemis 3, here at the very far right of the timeline, they'll launch from Earth and they'll dock at Gateway. And Gateway has a lunar lander that they will then get in and it'll transport them down to the moon, then back up to Gateway when they want to go back. So it's kind of a middle ground there. And so it's just going to be kind of an orbiting uh, station around the moon. Um, but besides the human aspect of that, there's going to be a whole bunch of things going on over the next couple of years, such as these commercial lunar payload services on the left side. And these are delivering science and technology payloads. Um, these are be important science experiments. Um, hopefully concrete is a part of that, uh, one of these, but uh, that's yet to be known and seen. And so there's a whole lot going on before we get back to the moon. Um, but uh, again, after 2024, the goal is to maintain a human presence one day. And that's gonna take infrastructure of some kind, whether it be habitats for the crew, uh, landing pads for the lunar, lo lunar lander that goes up to gateway and back, or just uh, storage areas for equipment that needs to be contained from the solar radiation and dust as much as possible. And uh, concrete material is feasible, right? It's the uh, most widely used construction material in the world here on earth and second in use only to water of all materials. And, uh, but the concrete we know and love here on Earth just will not be the same concrete that we have on the moon. So it's important to understand uh, what the concrete will be like and its microstructure and properties on the moon, as well as the environmental conditions. The moon poses a lot of challenges and we'll talk about those in a little bit. And that's where the real motivation lies is just from uh, making this program, the Artemis program a success in the future. As we all know, 3D printing of concrete materials is a fe feasible option. These are from uh, some images from Penn State that competed in NASA's 3D printed habitat challenge. I believe they took second place overall in this competition. 
And uh, the, another motivation for this project, right, is I'm focusing a lot on the microstructural development and the durability aspects of an in situ lunar concrete. But that doesn't mean a whole lot if that material can't be 3D printed. So uh, we'll start working together with these other uh, research groups and agencies that are working on 3D printing to make sure this material that I design not only has good microstructure properties, strength, uh, good durability, but can be 3D printed because that's really the end goal and the end use. Uh, we're not going to have our typical uh, construction crews where they're out there um, uh, pouring concrete, finishing the concrete. There's not going to be cranes and all that. It's thought to be done autonomously through 3D printing. And so these projects all need to come together and work together. There's a lot of moving parts to making this program a success. Uh, so we'll get into the experimental setup now. The, this was briefly covered in the video, but we've had two different sets of experiments take place on the International Space Station. They launched from Wallops Island in Virginia, that's shown there. Uh, one of them was on the Cygnus OA-9 uh, mission, and then they, one of them came back on the SpaceX Crew Resupply 15 mission off the coast of Baja, California, after the experiment was conducted. But uh, in our experiment, we had a variety of different constituents, everything from pure phases of OPC, such as C3A and gypsum, to uh, tricalcium silicate. And then we had ordinary Portland cement mixed with lunar simulant. And so we had a wide variety of uh, different designs to fully understand the difference that gravity has on the hydration process of cement. All of these were prepackaged uh, in burst pouches that are shown there in the top right image where water's in one compartment and cement's in another. Um, some of the pouches did contain isopropanol in a third compartment. And th these pouches really allowed the materials to stay separate but contained within the pouches until it was desired that they were mixed together. Um, the, the name burst pouch is a fitting name because the middle seal in between the two constituents can be burst with a little bit of pressure. So you'd roll up the outside edge of the pouch kind of like in the bottom GIF where I'm doing that. And with enough pressure exerted on that middle seal, it bursts, it allows the constituents to come in contact with each other. And then you can use your hands as well as the rubber spatula that you saw in the video to mix the materials together to a nice homogenous paste. After the paste was nice and homogenized, we came back with these plastic clips that you can also see in the bottom GIF to consolidate and contain all the materials at the bottom edge of the pouch. Uh, if they were had a third compartment for isopropanol, they were flushed at three hours, seven hours, and 24 hours after the initial mixing period. And this allowed us to arrest the hydration process and track the microstructural development as a function of time within that first day. Uh, the kinetics of the hydration process differ in microgravity, and we'll have a slide on that here in the future, uh, and why it's important to study these uh, reactions in microgravity. Uh, the bottom middle image there is Alexander Gerst. That was from the video. Uh, he's mixing one of our samples within the on the top of the maintenance work area, MWA, uh, in the International Space Station within a glove box. Uh, it's important that any work like this done on the ISS have multiple levels of containment. Um, as you know, when you first mix the cement and it, it's in its pasty form, you have a really high pH of 13 to 14 and upwards depending on uh, the design. And so you don't want that to ever uh, leak out of the pouch and then start floating away in space. And so it's important that there's multiple levels of containment. And so the pouch counts as one level of containment during the mixing process. The, the glove box counts as another level of containment. And then during storage, all of these are stored within uh, two Ziploc bags. And so there's never a chance of any uh, major spills or catastrophes for conducting these in the ISS. Uh, the, we've so, like I said, we had uh, two uh, sets of experiments done on the ISS. The first set had 18 sets of samples and the second set had four sets of samples. Our first set, our largest one, was really just focused on microgravity versus terrestrial gravity. So they were mixed in the glove box and then they were just put in storage as is for the hydration process. The second set, uh, we wanted to test in between gravity levels and when you're in microgravity, you can create centrifugal forces by just uh, rotation, right? And that allowed us to achieve the gravity levels of the moon, Mars, and then we had a third statistical point at 70% of Earth's gravity to give us kind of a full range of spectrum from everything from microgravity to terrestrial gravity. 
And this was done with the TechShot multi-use variable gravity platform. So the samples were mixed within the glove bag just like normal. And then they were packaged into these uh, uh, little black trays that the astronaut uh, Serena Williams there is holding. And then they were spun at these different gravity levels for a few days to uh, uh, have hydration at the, the specific gravities. Uh, well, again, it's important to study these in microgravity because you get distinctive microstructures. And this is really due to uh, some differences in the kinetics that you would expect uh, that you have here on Earth. On Earth, we have a lot of buoyancy and sedimentation forces due to gravity, as well as thermal solute convection, right? The hydration process of cement is an exothermic process. We track this through calorimetry curves all the time. That gives us a good insight to uh, what's going on in the microstructure. But in microgravity, all this is becomes minimized and no longer is a dominant force. And this really leads to a diffusion controlled hydration process where that just means that the movement of ions from a dissolving cement grain is from a zone of supersaturation right around the dissolving grain to a zone of undersaturation, right? Everything wants to be in equilibrium. So the movement of the ions that are dissolving is just through uh, diffusion. And so to get into some of our results that we have thus far, as well as our future work, uh, there's two important key things I'd like to show you uh, specifically on this slide is that microgravity really results in less bleeding as well as an increase in the amount of trapped air. On the left is the 80% tricalcium aluminate and 20% gypsum paste. In this paste, you're not gonna have necessarily etringite due to the ratio of the initial constituents. So you have a lot of the monosulfate as well as the calcium aluminate hydrates. But you can see uh, all the air bubbles that are trapped within the microgravity or space sample as highlighted there versus the ground sample where you hardly see any of them. Uh, this really makes sense, right? Because there's no buoyancy forces in microgravity. So the air has no reason to escape the viscous paste and just stays interlocked from the initial mixing period. On the right is a mercury intrusion pore symmetry curve, MIP, that shows the pore structure and the differences that microgravity has. This is for a tricalcium silicate or C3S paste that had a water to cement ratio of 2.0. Uh, we get asked a lot why we chose such a high water to cement ratio on this uh, specific paste. And it's really to highlight the differences in crystal morphology. They have ample space to grow, right? Given a high water to cement ratio, there's more space as well as a reduction in bleeding. Uh, bleeding is a common phenomenon you have here on Earth, right, where the water starts to segregate and sit at the top of the, the paste because of uh, there's too much water. And it's the difference in the specific gravities there, so it starts to segregate. Whereas in microgravity, again, there's no reason for the water to segregate and start to rise out of the paste. So it stays interlocked, and then it leads to a very porous network of pores. And so the microgravity curve, you can see there at the top red line, uh, about 50% of your pores are in the 10,000 nanometer range. Whereas in terrestrial gravity, um, due to the bleeding effect that you get, your 50% of your pores are in the 100 nanometer range. So there's a couple orders of magnitude difference when you have a reduction in bleeding and microgravity. Uh, again, going back to the uh, differences in uh, crystal morphology given the ample space. This is from that same uh, tricalcium silicate paste at a water to cement ratio of 2.0. On the left is a terrestrial gravity uh, crystal, and that is a Portlandite crystal or the CH. And you can see the nice hexagonal face there, but you can see there's no real depth to it. It starts to tail off, and you can see the void behind it. All of the needles that are on there are the calcium silicate hydrate. But on the right, you can see that the, the nice hexagonal face again, but you can see there's some depth to it with the CSH growing off of it. And it's also important to note that the CSH uh, is, doesn't grow as chaotically as it does in terrestrial gravity. You can see that there's some order to it where it's growing at an angle up to the right or up to the left and just kind of crisscrosses the whole way back. And so you, this can be visualized very well when you looked at a polished cross section of these samples. Uh, here it's very apparent that there is a, a reduction in bleeding in microgravity and the increase in the por overall porosity you have. I believe the, the terrestrial gravity had a porosity of around 45%, whereas this microgravity sample is almost 70% in porosity. And you can see the difference in the, the morphology of the calcium 
um, the Portlandite crystals, the CH crystals, those are the light gray in this image. The, the darker gray is the calcium silicate hydrate, and then the black, of course, is the porosity here. And you can see that the thickness in some of the CH crystals as compared to on the terrestrial gravity side where it's just kind of growing intermingled wherever it can in between the CSH. And this uh, illustrates the difference that gravity can have on these uh, curves quite well. I mentioned that some of our samples were ordinary Portland cement and contained a lunar simulant. A colleague of mine uh, and my advisor worked on uh, characterizing the mechanical properties and microstructural development of uh, an ordinary Portland cement that had a lunar simulant. In this case, the lunar simulant is JSC1A. And it's a highly amorphous alumina silicate glass. You can see that 66% amorphous and its composition is similar to what you see in a class F fly ash. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail here in a minute, but uh, part of that, just given its composition and amorphous content, uh, the reactivity, its posilonic reactivity was tested and quantified. Uh, this is done by a group at the University of Miami where on the y-axis you have the heat release that's measured through microcalorimetry. On the x-axis you have the calcium hydroxide consumption measured through TGA, thermogravimetric analysis. And based on where it falls within this chart, you can quantify the reactivity of the posilon. Uh, we tried three different uh, gradations. You tried the full gradation of the JSC1A as is, and then they tried the finer particles that were less than 45 microns, and then in between 45 and 75 microns. And you can see that the full gradation, the square, is down in the inert region, similar to quartz. Uh, whereas the finer particles, though, it, similar to the, the fly ash in the fall within that ellipsoid there. And so there does exhibit some posilonic reactivity similar to a fly ash, which kind of makes sense given its amorphous content as well as its composition. Um, but it's also important thing to note here is the reactivity of the finer particles as we get into this development of an in situ lunar concrete. Uh, that plays a large role in our designs. Another important aspect of the lunar or the lunar simulant JC1A in comparison to, I guess, a fly ash is its angularity in comparison. Fly ashes are typically viewed as a ball, and so they often increase the workability, giving a ball bearing effect where the, all the particles are starting to roll over one another. Whereas the angularity of the JC1A starts to reduce the workability because you get a lot of interlocking between the particles. And that's been an issue as I'm working with these initial uh, designs for this in situ lunar concrete uh, that we are working with. Uh, this is where we get into my future work on the development of an in situ lunar concrete and right now we are working with a geopolymer concrete. Uh, this really a geopolymer is a simple mixture. You need an alkaline solution such as a sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide combination or you can use a potassium silicate. And then you need an alumina silicate glassy source. Uh, this is often a fly ash or a fly ash and slag combo here on earth and when you mix these together you get your geopolymer concrete. Uh, the bottom is an XRF or the x-ray fluorescence analysis of the oxide composition of the lunar simulant JSC1A in comparison to a class F fly ash and uh, again the important takeaway for in creation of a geopolymer is the silica to alumina ratio and you can see they're quite similar for these and that becomes a, a good basis for us to compare to. We can use a class F fly ash for comparison to our lunar simulant to see how the properties vary. Uh, like I mentioned, the silica to alumina ratio plays a large role in this microstructural development. Uh, the reaction sequence really is you have initial dissolution of the alumina and silica from the fly ash or the lunar simulant. You start to get this initial gelation where you're starting to form these network and change of these alumina silicates and it finally polymerizes and hardens. Um, but the initial ratio that you have of the silica to alumina pay, plays a large role in the compressive strength as well as the smoothness. You can see the higher the silica to alumina ratio, you get a smoother uh, structure in comparison to some of the lower ones at like 1.15 to 1 1.4. Uh, luckily, most of the lunar soil is at least in the 1.6 and above region. Uh, for the silica to alumina ratio so we get these nice smooth uh, structures in comparison to something that was a bit lower. 
Uh, some environmental conditions that are also important to keep in mind as we move forward in developing uh, lunar concrete is the surface gravity. It's roughly a sixth of Earth. Uh, and so we, we started to get insight from that from one of our mixed experiments that we did in the centrifuge and the difference that has on the solidification. But again, those are uh, cement-based uh, materials and not geopolymers necessarily. And then you got to think about the atmosphere. There really is no atmosphere on the lunar surface. It's really a high vacuum at 3 times 10 to negative 13th kilopascals, where on Earth you're at 101 depending on your elevation, right? So that plays a large role into any kind of design because any liquid doesn't want to stay in its liquid form in an environment like that. And then the surface temperatures are, have huge fluctuations depending on where you're at on the lunar surface from anywhere from negative 171 degrees Celsius to 111 degrees Celsius. And then another large thing is a day on the moon is basically a month. And so all of this will play a large role into the durability aspects of a, any kind of lunar concrete and must be understood very well. Um, as far as other work that's been done on creating a geopolymer concrete, there's really only two studies that have been done and they used an one type of solution and it was an extra low solution ratio. So your solution to binder ratio is, I think they went clear down to about 0.2. And when you have a ratio that low, you don't get a nice workable paste. And so once it's mixed, you have to add extra pressure to help it consolidate and polymerize. Uh, we are going a different route right now. We're just trying to achieve workable paste and not do the added pressure necessarily. Uh, the one study that they made a couple cubes and then they characterized its basic properties in order to model the radiation protection. And they found that at a certain thickness that the radiation protection, again, because you have no atmosphere on the moon, uh, radiation is a huge concern to astronauts. At a certain thickness, the geopolymer concrete provides more than enough protection from the solar radiation. And then the other study looked at the influence of temperature as well as the vacuum environment on the compressive strength of the lunar geopolymer concrete. And I'll show you those results real quickly. Um, on the left is uh, the, their low solution geopolymer concrete cured at the average daytime lunar heat, which I believe they did 110 degrees Celsius. And you can see it goes from about the 3,250 PSI or 21 megapascals and starts to drop off and the uh, air bars get quite a bit larger too as time goes on. So the heat does uh, have an influence on the compressive strength of these. Uh, when you combine the heat with the vacuum, you start to get a significant drop in your overall compressive strength. Uh, you started again around maybe uh, 1400 at PSI, which is significantly lower when you have uh, just the heat, right? We started with around 3250 there and then it drops clear off down to uh, between about 500 PSI at 28 days. So uh, the durability aspect of these is a large issue. And again, this is from previous work that's been done that I'm using as a basis as I move forward because there's not a lot of literature out there on this topic right now. For some supporting reasons of why we want uh, to move forward with the geopolymer concrete over something like uh, an ordinary Portland cement that we know and love here on earth and works so well is the goal is really to utilize as much in situ lunar resources as possible. Uh, we don't want to have to be bringing stuff from Earth to the moon that we don't need to. Uh, you don't want to mess with that necessarily and it's super expensive to uh, ship materials out of Earth's orbit. Uh, one of the last reported estimates by NASA to ship a pound of material out of Earth's gravitational force is $10,000 a pound. And so you start talking about building full-on infrastructure and the, the weight of cement that, that becomes a huge uh, expense and it's not feasible. Uh, so we wanna use the in situ lunar resources that are available to us and find a way to make those work instead of bringing stuff from earth. Uh, and the creation of something like an ordinary Portland cement on the moon is just not really possible. One between the technology, the uh, cement set up like a cement batch plant and cement uh, kiln and all that to produce the cement is just a uh, uh, technologically not the most feasible option, as well as the calcium content in lunar regolith is really minimal. Um, if you remember the XRF analysis from a few slides ago, uh, the calcium content is like 9%, whereas in an ordinary Portland cement, calcium oxide makes up uh, about 60%, I believe, of the overall constituent. So uh, 
that's kind of out of the question right now. And that's why we're moving forward with a geopolymer concrete given the composition of the lunar soil. And over 90% of the mass can be just of the lunar regolith itself. The remaining portion is your water and sodium silicate solution. Um, the group that did the extra low solution ratios, I believe they had 95% of the mass was uh, the lunar regolith. And so if you have uh, lower solution ratios and added pressure, you can even get the, that number higher. But this really depends on the initial gradation of the material as I have found out and we'll get into that. Uh, this project, again, this is part of my fellowship I received, this NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Opportunity. And so this just really kicked off about a month, of, month about, yeah, about a month ago now. And so we're in the preliminary groundwork stage right now where I'm trying a variety of sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide combinations as well as potassium silicates. Uh, and we're going to try different curing temperatures, right? We saw that made a difference from published literature as well as a vacuum environment to see if we can help with the durability aspects of these materials. Uh, this groundwork's really done to finalize some mixture designs that we can do for an actual ISS flight experiment to see if uh, we see the same kind of results that we see with our uh, cement-based constituents. And it, right now it's proposed that we're going to do these in the burst pouches because those were proven to work and feasible within the mixed projects and if something's not broken, don't fix it type of deal. And this really allows for good microstructural development comparison uh, once the samples return. So for some preliminary results that we've obtained the last few weeks, uh, I've found that these initial mixture designs are highly dependent on the particle size distribution. Uh, like I said, we're going to compare some of these to a fly ash, and the fly ash is going to be supplemented with an Ottawa sand, which is just kind of the inert filler within the system. Um, right now, though, I'm trying to use the JSC-1A as is. I just kind of put myself in a scenario that if you're on the lunar surface, uh, what's the simplest way to make this possible without having to like sieve in the specific gradation. So I'm trying it as is right now. Um, and you'll see that 75 or 63% of the JSC-1A is finer than 75 microns. And uh, depending on your cement, that can be the typical cutoff for cement fineness. And so that is what I am assuming to be the binding component of the JSC-1A as the larger particles, as we also saw, are less reactive. Um, because such a high percentage of the JSC-1A is finer than 75 microns, it's significantly increased my solution mass right now. So you can see in the bottom table, two mixtures that I've tried where the JSC-1A is roughly 75% and the solution mass makes up about 25%. And I know I said that 90% of the mass can be just the lunar regolith itself, and that's still feasible. However, uh, we'll have to try specific gradations of the, the lunar simulant to the point where we have uh, less, uh, less of the fines and more of the coarser particles that are rather inert. Uh, and these are sodium silicate mixtures that I uh, supplemented with uh, sodium hydroxide to raise the pH. Um, the sodium hydroxide molarities that I've tried are 10 and 14, and this results in a, a modulus of 1.5 and 2.0. And again, there's a lot of dissolved solids within sodium silicate and sodium hydroxide, of course, so the actual water content of these mixtures is around 60%. Um, for these to gain ample strength, uh, we initially cure these for 60, at 60 degrees Celsius for three days. Uh, we found that these uh, lunar simulants right now, we are having a harder time getting them to sit under ambient conditions, but I'm working with that now to uh, improve that. So we're trying uh, curing temperatures right now. Uh, 60 degrees Celsius is common for geopolymers, and then we will work our way up also to the lunar temperatures of like 110 degrees Celsius. As far as some preliminary compressive strength results go, I've got some three-day and seven-day strength results I'll share with you. Uh, the 10 molar sodium hydroxide uh, solution has a compressive strength around 3,000 PSI, kind of bouncing around there at the three and seven-day mark, whereas the 14 molar sodium hydroxide with the higher pH resulted in uh, PSI strengths of around 4,000. Uh, it's important to note a lot of these geopolymer concretes uh, don't continually gain strength after the initial curing period that's uh, been uh, reported before. Um, it's not always the case, but it's different than like uh, Portland cement where you're getting continual strength gain throughout the first 28 days where it starts to topple off. So these are just kind of bouncing around their initial strength gain at the three-day mark at the, and at the seven-day mark. 
Another important aspect of this project that I mentioned is the durability aspect. And so we are going to test these geopolymer lunar concretes in an environment as close to the lunar surface as we can without actually being on the moon. And so we're going to pre-make some small samples. They're going to be uh, small uh, little rectangular shaped samples. And these are going to be a part of the MISI 15 flight that's scheduled for the beginning of 2021. Uh, MISI stands for the Materials International Space Station Experiment. And it's a platform outside the ISS that allows these type of materials as well as a, a variety of other things to be exposed to the environment outside of the ISS. Uh, and so these will be pre-made on Earth. They'll be placed into the blue carrier trays that you see on the right side. And they will be shipped to the ISS and placed outside. And then the cover of the carrier will come off and they'll be exposed to the extreme environment. And this will really allow these geopolymer lunar concretes to undergo uh, exposure to the high vacuum environment as well as extreme temperatures and solar radiation. Uh, concurrently with that, we will leave just normal samples here in a laboratory environment to have as a control and basis for when the samples return. Uh, they should be exposed outside the ISS for a minimum of six months before uh, they start to return. Once they do, we'll do our microstructural analysis. Um, so once we get them back, there's a lot of different techniques that we can use. Some of the ones we are planning on right now, of course, is scanning electron microscopy as a good way to look at any kind of uh, deformation, cracks, uh, shrinkage effects that may occur, as well as uh, you can combine that and do image analysis. This is something I do pretty frequently with my uh, the original MIX experiment that went to the ISS. We do this all the time where you can threshold the image and quantify uh, percentages of porosity or the CH or the CSH as well as the raw materials uh, through that and get you can also produce a uh, pore size distribution curves and a plethora of things through uh, SEM. It's a very powerful technique. Uh, so we also plan to do mercury intrusion pore symmetry. Uh, that gives us a nice idea of the pore structure and density of the materials and how gravity influences that. Uh, this will be more for more so for the samples that were a part of the experiment we plan to do inside within the burst pouches as well as nuclear magnetic resonance this is a good way to understand the differences in bonding of the alumina silicate chains that have formed in the geopolymer and so we'll do some of that studying on both the samples inside the iss and outside the iss to see uh, what influence gravity has as well as the extreme environment has on the, the network of the polymer. And while the, our samples are quite small, of course, they're not uh, normal cylinders by any means, and they lack a definite shape half the time, so uh, we can't do our traditional mechanical testing like compressive strength and all of that. So we're going to look at the micromechanical properties through indentation techniques such as nano indentation and uh, micro hardness testing. And this will give us an idea of whether there's any micromechanical differences between the two samples that were left here on Earth and the ones that were done on the ISS. Ultimately, though, th to kind of summarize and wrap up, we just want to supply enough data to help advance the use of concrete materials for lunar infrastructure. Uh, this project and this work is one small piece to a very large puzzle to make the Artemis program. Uh, possible. We saw everything from these all the rocket testing to 3D printing to uh, the creation of this concrete. It's all got to come together and be successful. And so we want to understand this microstructural development and durability aspects of the geopolymer concrete to create this material, but we also want to provide enough data to help advance other research fields. Like I said, uh, this really doesn't mean a whole lot if it, the material I develop and work with can't be 3D printed. So uh, part of this project will be able to make sure that it can be 3D printed and uh, supply data to that research field, as well as design and certification methods. Uh, we print these habitats on the moon. How do we know that they're going to hold the strength that they were designed to? And so we'll give data to those research fields that need it, as well as computational materials and a lot of uh, modeling of this uh, and for this extreme environment. And the manufacturing processes, right? We create this material, but how do we get all of our constituents from the lunar uh, regolith. And so all of this will come together to uh, help explain a bigger picture and make uh, human habitation on the lunar surface possible through the Artemis program. Uh, with that being said, I've got a couple slides of acknowledgments for a long list of people who make this work possible. 
Uh, specifically, this development of an in-situ lunar concrete is supported by a NASA Space Technology Graduate Research Opportunity. Uh, the NASA grant number shown there in SLIPSRA for making the MIX project possible. Insights from these valuable people at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Uh, the Pennsylvania Space Grant Consortium for funding one of my internships at uh, NASA, as well as the National Space Grant Foundation for the other one. Uh, we had an awesome science concept review committee uh, from some well-known names in the concrete research field who oversaw and helped our initial planning stages for the MIX project as well as the LIDOS team who prepackaged all of our samples here for the ISS flight. And lastly, this wouldn't have ever been possible without the astronauts of Expedition 56 who mixed and conducted our samples on board the ISS. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If there's any questions in the future that aren't answered in the Q&A, my email address is shown there. And I'd be happy to answer them in the future. That was really, really something, something special. Thank you so much. I mean, it was, as, as you said, as they said in the video, out of this world. So it was, yeah. I was really like uh, glued to the screen listening and with a lot of ideas. And I'm very happy to say that I see the presentation has generated quite a few questions already. Right. And I'm sure that new ones will come up. So, uh, I mean, before beginning, uh, I really want to thank you again and congratulate you and uh, the team that you're in and of Dr. Radlinska that uh, I'm happy to see that is uh, also here in the audience. So uh, probably if there are some uh, more general questions, we can get uh, really detailed answers from, from both of you. So uh, I'll begin with the Q&A questions. Uh, so my apologies if I don't go in chronological order how they came in, okay. but I will try to cover them like that. So uh, the first one is from Biranchi Panda. Uh, I think this was probably covered later by your talk about geopolymer, but maybe mm -hmm. we can drive the point again. What is the goal of using cement as a binder in microgravity as cement is not available in space? So maybe just a recap on that and the general direction of... Uh, yeah, so we originally used cement in our original mix project. One, that project was more so to help understand uh, cement hydration in this unique environment, as well as provide uh, insight to well-known materials that we know here on Earth, uh, how gravity will influence those. And now we are shifting gears towards the geopolymer concrete because that is what's feasible to be built on the moon, uh, given its composition and insights of the solution like i said the sodium silicate and water can all theoretically be extracted through uh, electrolysis procedures that nasa is working on this completely different research field but uh, my thoughts um, I mean, nasa could do whatever none of this is representative of nasa of course they could change their mind but i think a geopolymer concrete is definitely uh, the the way to go for uh, building on the moon just given the materials and availability of the soil there okay Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, kind of related to a question that I was going to pose, so I'll maybe combine them together. Uh, by N. Balaji saying, uh, can we have bio binding materials instead of cement or any pozzolanic materials? How these research outcomes are sustainable? So I'll tie into the second part of this question, and it's a kind of a wider topic that's very interesting, thinking about sustainability outside of the scope of the <laughs> Earth. Uh, my point to this would be, uh, what happens if we have some rejected concrete, or what is the end of life of such structures? Uh, are they ever uh, demolished or something like that? What would we require? I mean, would uh, transporting machinery for this be, be an issue? So. His question is like, are there alternatives to pozzolanic materials? And then the general would be like, how we think of sustainability in the scope of the moon. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I mean, the sustainability aspects is something that uh, environmental conditions and the wear and tear on the concrete is gonna play a large role. And so I'm yet to see, I guess, uh, what the environment could do to the moon and uh, the overall sustainability of a concrete material. Um, there's going to be a lot of unanswered questions right now as far as that goes. I can't tell you specifically what I think is going to happen in the future there um, and the direction that NASA goes and the equipment that they have on the moon to 
build this kind of infrastructure as well as maintain it and make it sustainable. Um, that's a whole other, I feel like, research field too. I'll, I'll just have a, sh a short follow up on that. I mean, you showed uh, like the award, uh, the award winning or second prize structure mm -hmm. by Penn State. Uh, what is the idea with like foundations on the moon? Or what is the, the idea on like structure soil <laughs> interaction and what, yeah, how is this structure actually, yeah, what's its foundation? On the moon? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a whole uh, architectural firm I think NASA works with that works on the design of these type of structures. I mean, you can print a foundation, uh, 3D print it. NASA and uh, Penn State actually did that as part of this, and maybe Dr. Edlinska can chime in on the foundation aspect. But um, I think they can print a foundation, and then there's also all kinds of uh, habitat designs and concepts, right? I mean, you kind of have a dome shape or something. And then there's talks of just putting lunar regolith on top of the concrete material on the outside to add more radiation protection. And so the, the feasibility and aspects of which direction that they're going to go with their habitats and their overall designs yet to be answered necessarily. I mean, there's a big uh, work. There's a lot of work going on as far as habitat design. Um, I don't know the aspects of the 3D printing. Um, we've just started, I believe, here shortly. We're going to start working with some NASA personnel on the 3D printing side of things and getting these geopolymers to work in that aspect. Um, and so there's, there's other people working on that side of things. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the next one is by El Khalil El Kabir saying, Dear Dr. Collins, I saw a scope of this outstanding research study in 2018 and today I'm happy to see closely the results. My questions are, could we use the aggregates of the moon in the cement paste? And how did you create the moon environment? Could you please elaborate more? Perhaps some of it you already covered, but uh, about, yeah. Yeah, so the, the real thought behind this is that anywhere you land on the moon, you can just use the soil that you have there to create this geopolymer. And that acts as both the, the, the binding compartment, the, the fine aggregate will act as the binding because of its aluminous silicate glassy content. And then the larger ones are more inert because they're just a larger surface area or the smaller surface overall surface area, right? And so they will uh, be the aggregate, the, the filler portion of that. But uh, the thought's just to be able to scoop it up right there on the lunar surface. The composition of the lunar or the soil varies from where you're at on the moon, but um, all of it's, uh, from what I've seen, feasible to be done as a geopolymer concrete. We have a couple of more in this uh, direction. So uh, Ana Carolina Trindade, uh, beside congratulating you and your team on the great work, is asking how could cement be transported to the moon in large scale? And would it present improved performance when compared to a few studies with lunar regolith as the main binder product? And I think I'll follow that up with the question of Alistair McLeod that's saying, in situ is the idea for this geopolymer mix to collect the lunar regolith into the robotic printer, then combine with the alkaline solution and then extrude under pressure. Correct. Um, so getting cement to the moon, uh, I just don't think is economically feasible. Um, like I said, the last reported estimate by NASA was $10,000 to ship a pound of material out of Earth's orbit, and that's just out of Earth's orbit. That doesn't even include cost of trying to get it on the surface of the moon on the other end. And so I just don't see that being feasible. I mean, the technology of rockets has come a long way since uh, NASA reported that estimate and SpaceX and all these other companies have been able to bring that cost down, I think. But I think uh, as far as shipping stuff to the moon, the real thing that'll be shipped will be like the 3D printing equipment and anything to process the lunar regolith. But the materials that it actually be in the concrete are theoretically all on the lunar surface. So we shouldn't have to necessarily bring anything to the moon for that. Um, but yes, the thought is as far as processing goes that they will be able to somehow autonomously collect the lunar soil. If they need to meet certain gradations, they'll be able to process it and then they'll be able to extrude it under some sort of pressure again, because nothing wants to stay in a liquid form on the, the lunar surface, right? Just given the vacuum environment. So it's going to have to be done in some kind of a pressurized area initially. Okay. Uh, 
this is very interesting, the last point that you made, and I'll follow it up with a few questions that we have from Jean-Michel Parenti. Uh, first one is, what about the production of uh, uh, NaOH, of uh, sodium hydroxide on the moon? Uh, don't you expect a very high shrinkage in vacuum conditions and the risk of cracking? Uh, yes. So. As far as sodium hydroxide production on the moon, I can't necessarily answer that. I, theoretically, they tell me all of this is possible to be done through electrolysis procedures that the lunar regolith has the sodium silicate in the water that we need. Uh, sodium hydroxide may be a different story um, for extracting and mix, making that kind of solution. Uh, but drying and shrinkage in the cracks, they're all uh, a very large concern, right? Um, I showed you those previous studies that had done this kind of geopolymer concrete under a vacuum and heat, and they showed significant decrease in their overall strength for the longer that they were in that environment. And I imagine a large part of that was due to uh, cracking and durability aspects like that. So that is definitely a concern. And that's where some of these other aspects of uh, uh, maybe insulating the concrete with other soil and uh, putting a coating or something on top of that to help with these kind of issues will be uh, a, a solution to that. I mean, it's going to have to be protected somehow because I imagine cracking is going to be a very large concern. Yeah, yeah I imagine also considering what the durability aspect that you also mentioned yeah. of, of radiation. And Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so we have a question by Manzur Dar, and perhaps uh, if it was covered, you can expand a bit. Are any type of admixtures used in lunar concrete? If yes, then which one? Uh, so right now we haven't gone down that road. We're trying to make this um, as 100% in situ to the moon as possible and not have to ship any admixtures. Um, but that's not to say they won't be used in the future. I mean, it's very feasible to think that this uh, these geopolymer concretes that I'm working with in the lab just won't set up in time if they're 3D printed. So we may need an admixture or something to speed up the solidification process. But the, the thought right now is not to necessarily use any admixtures because we want to keep this as much as an in situ to the moon as possible and not have to bring that type of thing from Earth. Thank you. Um, there is another question by Anna Carolina Trindade saying, is there an estimation regarding hardening processes, both with cement and geopolymer materials? For example, would the water entrapped in the system accelerate dehydration or would it take longer? Um, so the water trapped inside, at a certain point, there's just too much water for the amount of cement particles that you have. Like our uh, water to cement ratio of 2.0, there is no uh, raw C3S left in that solution anymore. And there's definitely ample water sitting on top. And so uh, at a certain point, there's just too much water for the mixture. Um, that really illustrated the difference in the pore structure, but it's also not good for strength, right? To have a very porous network. So there's gonna be have to, our solution ratios that we know here on earth are definitely better suited for that. That uh, high ratio is just really used to illustrate the differences in crystal morphology as well as the reduction in bleeding and illustrate the effects that gravity can have. Um, we're not proposing that be an actual design uh, ratio of any kind. Okay, thank you. Uh, since we're discussing these different alternatives, there is a comment in the chat also. Uh, can we try sulfur concrete for lunar base? So my uh, NASA, one of my NASA mentors, Dr. Richard Grugel, his name was on the first slide. He's uh, done a ton of research on sulfur concretes and uh, it has all kinds of issues from once it's in a vacuum environment, it turns into like a muffin it, it just expands like crazy. Um, and they also deteriorated it significantly under those kind of heat and conditions. And so, yeah, it was a, a feasible for the composition of the lunar soil by all means, but when they put it under uh, not even a high vacuum like the surface of the moon, but just a vacuum, a normal vacuum chamber that you have in your everyday lab. There's all kinds of issues on that. Peter, so this is oh. Alexandra. Uh, if I can. Hello, hello, yes. Hello. hello, if I can just make a comment to tie up everything that Peter is presenting. We have to know the basic material science of the binder that we know well on Earth. 
before we can explore these novel materials for extraterrestrial applications. So I've seen this question. I've been monitoring Q&A saying, you know, why do you work with cement when there's no cement on the moon? And the answer is, even though we still don't know everything about earth-based cement materials, we know quite a bit and we have to build up the material science, the differences between gravity and non-gravity formation of the binders before we can start thinking of how these novel materials would respond. So I'll give it back to Peter. Thanks for explaining everything so well, Peter. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. Thank you for us. No, I, I exactly and agreed. We need to, to build our knowledge from uh, solid foundations, so to say. Uh, in, in this slide, uh, there is a comment and question by Ignacy Casanova. Uh, in the chat, there is a reference to uh, a study, I suppose, of sulfur concrete, a viable alternative for lunar construction. Uh, I think we have covered this. And um, uh, Ignacy says very interesting research. And of course, lots of questions arrive, arise at this point, uh, since uh, it's presumed your PhD is in the early stage. Uh, Ignacy's comment is that I think that you cannot really compare the Pozzolanic reaction in a fly ash with uh, JSC1, mainly because the most important factor is composition and both are significantly different. Uh, do you plan to do thermal vacuum experiments? Of course, keep up the good work and uh, I, as you, for any contact, you have already provided your email, so I encourage everyone to uh, contact uh, Peter. So basically the question is, uh, your comment on this comparison, uh, JSC1, and do you plan to do thermal vacuum experiments? Yeah, that's definitely come up, and we've we've noticed the difference that the reaction has on a fly ash compared to the JSC1A. They are quite different, um, and that's that's a very good point too, and something we are working with and looking at as far as reactivity goes. Um, as far as the thermal vacuum goes, yes, there's a a group here and I think in the aerospace and mechanical engineering department that has a very high vacuum as well as the ability to change the temperature and we will once we solidify some designs and get some uh, mixtures that we actually like we'll test those under this uh, vacuum thermal vacuum environment a high vacuum and the temperature to see what that has it uh, on the effect of the curing process in the first 28 days of these uh, little cylinders I'm working with. Okay. Um, so, uh, Alistair McLeod is asking you first, uh, are you considering complementary techniques for your upcoming work, like uh, XRD or X-ray CT, in order to analyze the 3D poor network structure? Might be dependent upon the volume of material available for testing, of course. Yeah, so we'd love to do all kinds of testing and techniques. We do a lot of uh, X-ray diffraction right now on our current mix samples. Uh, may get into that with the geopolymer except those are kind of typically analyzed through the NMR just given the luminous silicate network that forms between those and they're not as much of a crystalline hydration product that you experience in cement but uh, as far as like micro CT we're going to plan on doing some of that work for our initial mixed projects if the opportunity comes up again in the future when I get my geopolymer samples back um, then yeah we we'll, I mean that would be Fantastic, but I mean, all that's kind of based on availability as well as time. So um, we are considering that though. There are definitely other techniques that we will consider. Okay, great. Uh, another one by Alistair saying, regarding the ISX, ISS experiments, the pastes were mixed or combined by hand. Is there any effect of confinement or compression on the microstructures? I wonder if the material forms uh, a loop I wonder if the material forms a loose, wet lump, unlike a traditional consolidating paste on Earth, after initially combined by an astronaut, and are there proposed ways to counteract this high porosity effect? Yeah, so the materials were combined in the pouches. I mean, it's kind of by hand, but they're not actually ever touching the constituents. So they burst that middle seal and that allows them to flush the water over into the cement and then they pretty much just press the pouch with their fingers and they have a rubber spatula they can mix it around with. So it's never outside the pouch, um, but it was mixed for a few minutes with the rubber spatula in the hand to achieve a nice homogeneous mix. And we see that in the microstructure that everything looks pretty uniform and spread out. And so we're getting a nice homogeneous mix out of that. As far as counteracting the higher porosity, that's really only seen in our higher water to cement ratios. It's not as big of a deal 
in the the lower water to cement ratio samples that we have again because there's you there, you don't experience bleeding at the lower ratios here on Earth and there's no and it'd be the same for in microgravity. Um, those higher water to cement ratios and the higher uh, pore network are just more of a uh, more of a result of the higher water to cement ratio. Again, we're not necessarily proposing to ever do those. Those were just to illustrate the effects that microgravity has. Thank you for answering, and also thank you from Alistair, who's thanking you for uh, the detailed answers. Uh, we have a question by Peter Gemperle. Uh, this is now, I think, for the future plan. Do you have any plans to make the concrete reinforced in any way? Is reinforcement required for lunar conditions? No, I have not gone down that road as far as reinforcement of lunar concrete, so I can't answer that to the best extent. Um, there are a lot of conditions, though, and things that would uh, mean the vacuum rights. You're going to want some kind of tensile reinforcement of some kind. I don't know how they would plan to ever do that. Um, but another point to make, too, is that the, like, the gravity is a six of Earth's, so you don't need as strong of concrete necessarily to support the, the masses because it's, I mean, you're a six of the weight. So um, that's another consideration to make too. When we go forward with these designs, we don't necessarily need to have strengths of four or 5,000 PSI because everything weighs a sixth of the, the mass up there, of the weight. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, what a few times I've been, I've been thinking that, uh, okay, these are now of course uh, in situ structures, uh, but imagining like a, a building on the moon, the size of the members uh, could be much, much smaller, but even yeah. psychologically, this would be an impression on humans. Imagine you are safely walking on a slab that is so much thinner that you are, yeah. so there's, there's that to overcome as well. Um, Okay, so uh, we have a question from Vlad Shekovsov. He is our, our panelist that he is writing to us through the chat. Um, the first question is about water. Uh, what water properties, uh, mineralogically, uh, rigidity, you have used in, in the experiments and why this choice? And the second about compressive strength, uh, the tendency that it will decrease through time. If you could explain this, please, uh, in a bit more depth. Well, there is a third one, but yeah, let's let's start with these two. So the first one is the choice of water, and the second, the decrease of compressive strength through time, if I understood. Yeah, so the water right now is that I'm using is just distilled deionized water in the laboratory environment. Um, I imagine the water on the moon is going to be quite different when they go through this electrolysis process to extract it from the lunar regolith. We have not combined these two topics together quite yet. Um, we're just kind of in these preliminary stages of getting things to work. I could see that happening further down the road where um, someone at NASA in that research field kind of extracts the, I, the, the water from the regolith and then we can end up using that in the mixtures to see if that has any influence on our, uh, our concrete in the end. And what was the second question? Uh, the second question is about compressive strength and mm -hmm. if I understood the tendency that it will decrease through time, if you could explain this. Yes, yeah, so um, doesn't necessarily decrease within time, but the, the overall, the environmental conditions could decrease it over time just due to the, the high vacuum environment that would cause cracking and uh, the, the shrinkage of the concrete. That and the temperatures could have a significant variation when you go from a negative 170 degrees Celsius to 111 degrees Celsius over the span of the month of the day on the moon, right? That's gonna have significant roles in the, the overall strength of the concrete as time goes on. Um, if we could just mimic a nice earth environment where we have a vacuum or no vacuum and nice pressure and normal temperatures, these uh, extents of these other environmental conditions wouldn't be a concern and the strength wouldn't necessarily decrease over time. So we got to find a way to combat that issue right now. The moon just poses some challenges that we've never faced before. It certainly does. Uh, the last third question uh, is about, I think, vaporation in time of hardening in extreme temperature. Am I getting that right? The evaporation like liquids? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't ever see these ever being feasibly done in a 3D printing environment that's exposed to the, uh, mm -hmm. just exposed to the lunar environment and the lack of atmosphere. I feel like these are going to have to be done in some kind of uh, temporary deployable bubble where it allows it to be 3D printed under either a 
pressurizer environment of some kind where the it'll remain in its liquid form until the concrete has hardened to its uh, uh, strength and capabilities and then you can move the bubble and keep moving on with the structure of some kind but um, that's definitely a concern I don't think it would I mean a vacuum environment that hard I don't see a liquid ever staying in a liquid form for very long I mean that's probably gone in seconds and uh, his last one is could you explain again uh, in a bit more detail the necessity of using isopropanol yeah, we used isopropanol to arrest the hydration process. Um, that's commonly used to uh, diffuse through the microstructure and pull out any of the water that's left within the paste. Um, that stops the hydration process because you remove the water from the, the microstructure. And that uh, allowed us to uh, pull out all the water from our solidified paste at three hours, seven hours, and 24 hours. And this allowed us to track the microstructural development as a function of time. And so uh, we have some work in review right now where you can see significant changes in the microstructure from three hours to seven hours and the densification uh, as these hydration products start to form and same for seven to 24 hours. And so that just really allowed us to track the, the crystal formations as well as densification and changes in the microstructure within the first day. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think the final one that I have is uh, by Satish Venkata. I think we already discussed it, but maybe you want something to add. It says lunar concrete has to take substantial tensile loads on the structure. What has to be done uh, to take care of this? I think this is uh, in line with what we said about reinforcement, cracking, shrinkage, but if there's anything you want to add. Yeah, I don't necessarily have anything else to add for the, uh, the strength of it. Um, you gotta withstand the environmental conditions, of course, we've mentioned a, a couple times now, such as the vacuum environment, as well as the gravitational force is less, so it doesn't need to be as strong in that way, but um, it's definitely gonna be a role in what they end up using. Um, we haven't gotten to that point yet, as far as actual habitat designs and the 3D printing aspect, and whether there needs to be reinforcement of some kind to withstand the environment and the loads, but. Um, that's all going to get considered in the next few years as this work goes forward for NASA. In the light of that, I, I have a question which I don't know if, if it makes sense or not, but is, is the moon in uh, danger of like um, impact by small particles, uh, asteroids or things? And yeah, I guess this would yeah, be... Yeah, um, when you don't have it, you have a lack of an atmosphere, right? It's this bombardment from all kinds of particles and small meteorites is a, a larger concern for sure than it is uh, here on earth when a lot of the smaller particles and stuff start to just deplenish as they go through the atmosphere right and so that is a large concern and um, something that will have to be uh, taken care of and thought about um, but and then the solar dust is a huge thing right the little vacuum environments you get particles that are floating everywhere and so that's another reason for these habitats and pieces of infrastructure to protect the, the astronauts as well as the equipment from being continually just covered in these uh, charged particles that are on the surface just due to the lack of an atmosphere. Yeah, it's a whole new world, so. Yeah, it is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, I mean, uh, many words of congratulations and thanks are pouring in in the chat and Q&A and, Q and I, I really also on my part can say it was fantastic to hear all of this and I'm sure that everyone enjoyed. Uh, I don't know, currently we don't have any more questions. Let's maybe give it uh, one more minute if, uh, if something comes through. Um, but generally, I think we have discussed a lot. Of course, I mean, uh, because uh, it's such a new topic, uh, yeah. All our questions are very wide, but of course you're, yeah. you have to start by a very narrow investigation and that's, that's the right way to do. I'm personally very happy to see that NASA is uh, going forward with a lot of this work. And uh, yeah, it's uh, really, really great. So since I don't uh, see anything else, um, I think we can slowly close uh, the webinar. I have to say that, and people have asked this in the chat, uh, will there be a link? Yes, in, in due course, the webinar will be uploaded on the FIB YouTube channel uh, in order to be uh, shared and viewed by anyone. So this will be available uh, relatively quickly. And 
Yeah, I, I want to thank uh, the FIB, the FIB Young Members Group uh, for organizing, but finally, of course, and mostly Peter for accepting to do this, taking uh, his busy schedule and presenting us all of these great, great results. So uh, let's say that we check back with you in, let's say, a year and hear about the new progress being made. That would be actually a very great. Nicole, yeah. maybe Peter wants to say some his feeling yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course. We are yeah. allowed to listen to you. Yeah, thank you guys for having me today. This was a great opportunity to share some of this exciting work. And it's uh, really exciting to see a different direction for uh, or a different field for civil engineering, right? Just like you said, this is a, as close as a civil engineer can get to being a national in the aerospace department. So it's an exciting field to be a part of. And I think it's going to continually grow. I mean, I'm doing one small project, but they like through the Q&A, there's a lot of unanswered questions that are going to need to be answered. I definitely don't think I'll be able to conquer all those by the time I'm done. So I think this is going to be a growing industry and it's exciting for the, the field of civil engineering and people interested in concrete materials. So it's a really exciting work and I'm glad to be a part of it and I'm glad to be able to be able to share that today. Thank you. And, and we hope that uh, the FIB and the Young Members Group can also be a, a way to contribute and uh, yeah, I think the community will see this and perhaps in some future it's time for a task group or FIB commission dealing with uh, lunar concrete that we will definitely be the, the main experts. So <laughs> uh, uh, Peter could say an abstract for Lisbon uh, symposium. It, it is started to, <coughs> to start, starting to send, send in for abstracts. Yes, we have uh, open abstracts until uh, October 14th. This is one option. Of course, next year uh, is the Lisbon FID Symposium Annual, so the abstracts are still open. And even better, I think we have next year a uh, PhD Symposium in, in Paris. Uh, we had it this year online, but next year is going to be in person, hopefully. And it's a special format where PhD students have uh, almost 30 minutes for a presentation and discussion in really a lot of detail. So yeah, some something like this would be fantastic to, to yeah, hear sounds, somewhere in person in, in detail and discuss. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Thanks for sharing the information. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, with that, I want to thank uh, everyone again for joining and soon you'll be able to review and yeah, uh, repeat uh, what you learned today. So thank you so much. Thank you.